one. Welcome to FCPA Flash, the official podcast of FCPA professor and moderated by Professor Mike Kaler. FCPA professor is the leading source of daily FCPA news and commentary and the most authoritative source for those seeking to understand and apply the FCPA. To learn how FCPA professor can elevate your FCPA knowledge, please visit www.fcpaprofessor.com. FCPA Flash is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group manages your integrity and risk profile, turning compliance into a competitive advantage. The Red Flag Group assists companies in developing and maintaining efficient and effective corporate governance and compliance programs and has a proven track record in providing integrity due diligence investigations in 194 countries. Welcome to FCPA Flash. This is Professor Mike Kaler. And in today's episode, our guest is Matt Ellis. Matt is a member of the law firm Miller and Chevalier and has extensive experience in international anti-corruption compliance and enforcement, including the FCPA. Matt's specific focus tends to be Latin America, where he has spent several years in the region working for a multinational company and a government ethics watchdog. Indeed, I encourage you to visit Matt's FCPA America's blog, a site which covers anti-corruption issues with an emphasis on matters that relate to Latin America. Indeed, in the near future, Matt will be publishing one of the first books about the FCPA in Latin America, and you can read about the launch of this book uh, on his FCPA America's blog. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. Great. Thank you, Mike, for this, uh, this opportunity. Today in this episode, we are going to be talking primarily about Latin America, uh, including Brazil. And over the last few years, there has been much in the corruption discussion focused on Brazil, from enactments of a new law in Brazil, the so-called Clean Companies Act, to the Petrobras and related investigations, to happenings, including recent happenings in Brazilian politics. And much has been written about these developments, including some assertions by some commentators that these anti-corruption developments uh, in Brazil are linked to Brazil hosting the upcoming Olympics. Such an assertion, at least in my mind, uh, assumes causation. But you're the Brazil expert, so what do you make of the assertion that many of these corruption developments in Brazil are related to the country hosting the upcoming Olympics? Well, I, I think it's difficult to, um, you know, to attribute these developments specifically to the Olympics alone. And when you when you look back at the development over the years of the Clean Companies Act and of the current enforcement climate, um, the political changes that are occurring, you know, there are a lot of very complex factors that um, have gone into the mix. I mean, as you know, we've been riding about these issues since 2011. You know, when you look at the adoption um, of the Clean Companies Act in 2013, you know, at the end of the day, after years of efforts, what really triggered that event was um, the hike in, in bus fares uh, in, in the country, which then led to this real spillover effect. There was a huge frustration um, related to corruption issues in the country, um, and that led to a spillover where we had millions of people protesting throughout the country. And so there are a number of complex issues at play here. You know, it's interesting because in the international press, you know, we've seen a number of reports that aren't fully accurate uh, lately. There is a lot going on in Brazil. It's hard to keep up on top of everything. Recently, um, I came across some international media in which um, the reporting that Brazil's acting president had actually dissolved the CJU, the, the Comptroller General's office. As you might know, as I'm sure you know, my uh, TGU has been given um, certain responsibilities under the Clean Companies Act. It has authority to investigate uh, and apply administrative sanctions for the foreign bribery components of that act. 
Uh, it has concurrent authority to initiate administrative proceedings against uh, legal entities for, for bribery of local officials. So it has a number of powers, and there were reports saying that CJU had been dissolved, and you know, when you read the provisional measures that were passed, that's not exactly what happened. What in essence happened was CJU was given a new name by the new president. Now it's the Ministry of Transparency, Monitoring, and Control. And some might argue that the new entity has even more authority than the old entity and that it's now been elevated to a ministerial level. Um, and, and so it's recognized, um, you know, as having that level of authority. Um, so that's one more example I would offer of some of the, um, you know, false reports that are out there in, in the press these days. Yeah, it's always important uh, to get your information from reliable sources. And one of my frustrations in the anti-corruption space, you know, generally speaking, is that a lot of the what I'll call informational gatekeepers on anti-corruption developments tend to be non-lawyer journalists, uh, you know, who are writing on these topics and, and are a bit, uh, uh, shall we say, careless or, or loose in, in some of their terminology or indeed some of their uh, accuracy. So where do you see, see things uh, going in, in, in the future uh, in, in Brazil in terms of the anti-corruption conversation? Well, you know, Brazil is really an exciting, you know, it's at an exciting point, and it's really sending message to the rest of the region. And so we can talk about, you know, Brazil itself and how U.S. authorities are involved in the Lava Jato investigation, how 30 other countries apparently have investigations underway, you know, the dozens and dozens, dozens of individuals who have been uh, prosecuted locally. Uh, but what's been more interesting for me is, Seeing how Brazil has been uh, viewed from other uh, other parts of the region, because you know, whereas in some countries, you know, there is a, a real lack of attention. In others, people are are really watching what's happening in Brazil, and they're thinking about the implications for their own countries. You know, maybe to follow down that line a bit further, the way I see the region shaping up now is really the three categories of countries. First are you know, the countries who have not expressed an interest in anti-corruption developments internationally, um, and, you know, there's no real expectation for them to do so in the future. These would be the, you know, Venezuelas and the Ecuadors and the Bolivias of the region. Um, the second category are those countries who are making some efforts. Perhaps there's some local enforcement activity. Perhaps they have embraced international anti-corruption treaties. But, um, you know, you're not seeing the level or the depth of commitment um, that you might see in other countries. I would put in that second category countries like Argentina, Peru, uh, perhaps Chile. And then you have the third category of countries where you really are seeing, you know, developments on the ground that are notable. And this is Brazil, obviously, Colombia, I would put in that, in that group, and in Mexico, perhaps, as well. I mean, these are places where, you know, a few years back, um, anti-corruption compliance conferences might have been thinly attended, you know, if at all. Um, these days, you really sense a thriving, sophisticated, knowledgeable compliance community. You know, they're countries where local enforcement is beginning to take serious steps forward. So that's how I kind of see the region playing out now, different speeds, different commitments to anti-corruption. Uh, yeah, re uh, regarding um, some of the commitments or, or lack thereof of, of some of these countries, um, what do you attribute that lack of commitment to? Is it a, a deficiency in, in the laws as written? Is it a, a, a political issue? Is it perhaps a, a resource issue, which I guess in part could be political as well? What, what do you see as some of the root causes of that, that lack of commitment, as you called it? Well, I think oftentimes it's political. I mean, some of these countries just historically, um, you know, might not embrace uh, common international um, norms in terms of human rights, in terms of uh, trade, anti-corruption. Um, you know, the Venezuelas of the world have done that to their detriment. 
mean, we, if there's one major crisis in the region, one major economic crisis in the region, I mean, look at Venezuela. Um, every day it seems to be getting worse and worse. So I do think the political component has a serious, uh, is a serious factor. Turning to when the FCPA or, or other bribery laws are violated, I, I think it's interesting to sometimes study um, enforcement actions and, and trying to assign root causes to why the alleged conduct uh, took place you know, to begin with. And in many FCPA enforcement actions and, and others, um, you often see what I'll call a, a trade barrier or a trade distortion in that foreign country that places oftentimes a well-meaning company into a, you know, sort of an arbitrary world of, of government bureaucracy. And any time you have government bureaucracy, you have government officials um, with uh, oftentimes a tremendous amount of discretion. I know you've written on your FCPA America's blog uh, at various points about some of the common barriers and distortions in Latin America uh, that can serve as the root cause of, of bribery. Can you go through some of those um, for the listener's benefit? Definitely, yeah. And, you know, I think you're, 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 you're correct. Focusing on regulatory complexity I think is a good starting point. I mean, you're dealing with a regime that is known for highly complex bureaucracy, highly complex uh, rules. Um, you know, you look at the World Bank and it's doing business report and, you know, a, a country like Brazil is ranked, I think it's 169th out of 189 country uh, economies for, you know, the ease of getting construction permits or, you know, you, I re always rem remember a, a study that PwC did in a few years back where they analyzed paying taxes worldwide and they analyzed how many hours it took for companies to, you know, uh, to, to determine, you know, the taxes owed uh, pursuant to tax, local tax codes. And for Brazil, I mean, Brazil was the, one of the highest, if not the highest, 2,600 2, person hours required each year on average for a company to comply with the Brazilian tax code. And so, you know, what does this mean in terms of corruption risk? Well, it means that, you know, oftentimes when rules are more complex, that means more discretion that is in the hands of local officials. You know, to um, to make decisions that could potentially be influenced by improper payments. That often means more government officials who are involved in these types of um, regulatory uh, regimes. Every time you're interacting with another government official, it raises yet one more opportunity for a, a bribery request. It also means that companies oftentimes have to rely on local experts, right? I mean, despachantes in Brazil or gestores in Mexico, you know, the local experts who are, who know how to navigate local bureaucracy, which raises the potential for, you know, improper uh, third-party payments. So the regulatory uh, picture is, is certainly concerning uh, in Latin America. Another thing I, I write a lot about is just the institutional weakness. Uh, especially where, with respect to certain bodies with, with whom uh, companies oftentimes have um, interactions. Customs in Argentina is a perfect example. I mean, the customs program in Argentina is notorious for being corrupt. I mean, what we advise our clients is, you know, if you're new in Argentina and doing business there and bring, bringing equipment in, be ready to wait six months for that first shipment that first importation, because oftentimes that's what it takes, you know, to, to, to sit on an issue when the custom, when the corrupt government official is, is, you know, waiting for his bribe payments. Now, after you clear goods that first time without paying payments, you know, officials realize, okay, this company is, you know, it's easier from then on. But those are some examples of, of the types of root causes I often see in, in the region. Yeah, and from a compliance standpoint, understanding those root causes as they apply to your specific business is is still very important. It, it cannot be, you know, understated. And in my mind, I I think uh, 
you know, one of the more overused uh, uh, cliches in the FCPA compliance space is, you know, so-called tone at the top. None of these issues you've talked about, um, you know, the the root causes and some of these foreign bureaucracies, you know, ever reached the, the corporate boardroom, but these bureaucracies are um, encountered by oftentimes low-level um, employees within a business organization, but unless they are properly trained on the FCPA, um, it, it's a big risk area um, for companies. How do you advise your your, your clients, I know you just shared a few moments ago about um, some of these risk points uh, in, in Latin America. So then that is a good point. And you know, so many times you see companies that are moving to Latin America, they think they're doing the right thing by adopting a, you know, a standard policy and make, taking steps to implement that policy. You know, I call I call them the bookmarks of compliance. You know, there are two elements of compliance where so often you see companies just overlook overlook these steps. And the first is the risk assessment. I mean, how can you design your policies, implement your policies effectively if you haven't really taken a formal uh, approach to understanding risk? If you're doing business in a small Central American company, a uh, country where it's very um, probable that the local partner you're dealing with is connected in some way to the government because there is so much concentration of power in those small small jurisdictions. You know, you need to identify that ahead of time and adjust your compliance strategies accordingly. Um, that's different for, from, you know, if you're doing business in Mexico or Brazil where power is much more um, spread out. You know, and then the other bookmark is the, at the end is the audit. And again, we, you know, so many times I see companies that have policies in place, they have the tone at the top, but they're not going in at the back end, kicking the tires and checking to see if policies are being uh, implemented effectively. And without that final step, it's really hard to defend yourself, heaven forbid, if an enforcement authority is asking questions, um, because you're not able to say, look, I, I, I checked. I checked and I didn't find anything wrong. Yeah. I mean, we're often told uh, to not sweat the small stuff, but when it comes to FCPA compliance in, in many countries, including including the region you're most familiar with, it, it is the small stuff uh, uh, in, in many cases uh, because of some of these barriers uh, and, and distortions that, that companies encounter. Now, there are many companies in um, in the Latin American, uh, South American region that are currently under FCPA scrutiny, Petrobras, uh, Embraer, uh, SQM. Uh, the future may indeed see uh, an FCPA enforcement action against uh, one or even all of these companies, given that uh, FCPA jurisdiction is likely to be found because the companies have shares that are uh, traded on the U.S. market. You spend a lot of time on, on the ground in, in Latin America. Is there perhaps a, a common uh, reaction that you encounter um, when people learn that the U.S. government uh, may bring an enforcement action uh, against a Brazilian company or a Chilean company for their interactions with non-U.S. officials? Is, uh, what, what insight can you provide on that? Certainly, and I think this is one of the most interesting things uh, occurring in Latin America to, in Latin America today. You know that enforcement against local Latin American companies that have gone global, you know, who are now expected to operate pursuant to international anti-corruption compliance standards, um, and historically. Yes, I mean over and over again you hear this perspective. Well, what what you know what role what position does uh, well, what right does the U.S. government have? Does Uncle Sam have right to come down to my country and to tell me and my company what to do? And it plays right into this notion of imperialism, right? U.S. American gringo imperialism, and it's just one more example. And oftentimes, I mean, I cannot tell you the amount of times I've discussed that issue. It's an important observation. It's an important issue. But what we're starting to see is that notion being chipped away at a bit. And to give you a couple of examples, first, 
FIFA. Obviously, FIFA is not an FCPA case, but it does involve efforts by the U.S. government to bring corruption-related actions against entities not from the United States, in some cases and from Latin America, right? Um, and it's funny because in trainings and in discussions, you know, when I discuss FIFA, I ask people, do you think this is a good thing? You know, is it a good thing that the United States government is stepping up? And I have to tell you, Mike, you know, almost every time I've had this discussion, people say, yes, yes, it's good. And I say, well, wait, you know, you've been telling me that the U.S. shouldn't be getting involved in these jurisdictions. And they say, but this is different. You know, this is soccer. This is football. And no one has stepped up. And it's about time someone steps up, right? And it's a good thing the U.S. authorities are doing so. So, you know, there's that. There's what's going on in Brazil right now. I mean, people are fed up. And people realize that, yes, this is being led by local prosecutors, but they understand that the U.S. government is involved. I mean, you have, you know, Patrick Stokes, former head of FCPA unit, going down, meetings on the ground with local prosecutors. And this stuff gets publicized. And, what was interesting to me, I think most of all, was a study, a survey that was published uh, at the beginning of this year. And it was a firm that surveyed Brazilians' attitudes toward the Lava Jato investigation. And it said, do you support the Lava Jato investigation even if, it, if, if, the, if the fact is that the downturn in the economy is largely dependent on you know, this investigation, and nine out of ten Brazilians say yes. You know, even if this means, you know, loss of job opportunities and, you know, our investments going to the tank, we, we are fed up, we're sick and tired, and we think it's a good thing that Brazilian authorities and that other authorities are getting involved. So, you know, those are the types of developments I'm seeing, and one last thing I'll offer is the following. You know, this idea that a company should investigate itself, that should, you know, conduct an internal investigation, you and I might think that's okay, un, you know, that's understandable. Oftentimes in these jurisdictions, it's really something new and novel, this idea that a company should investigate itself, you know. I mean, the traditional view is, that's the government's job to, you know, investigate, identify, establish wrongdoing. We're not going to do that. We're not going to spend money and time doing the government's job for it, you know, for it. But these investigations that you're mentioning, I mean, what they're doing is they're really uh, generating this change in understanding of the meaning of an internal investigation. You know, you're beginning, people are beginning to realize that, hey, okay, we, yes, we do have a, a a responsibility when there are indications that are credible of wrongdoing within our organizations. We have a responsibility to get to the bottom of it. You know, if we don't, those issues could fester. There are all these market forces at play now as well, external auditors saying, look, you know, we're not going to endorse your financial statements unless you, you know, invest, go and investigate and figure out the reach of the alleged wrongdoing. So these Issues at play right now in the region for me might be the most exciting development. How is the um, final follow-up question here? You talked about internal investigations um, increasingly becoming a, a norm, whereas perhaps uh, you know a decade ago that would have been almost unthinkable for a company in that region to do that. What about uh, voluntary disclosures, taking it a step further, not even not just the company investigating itself, but perhaps the company then affirmatively uh, disclosing the results of its investigation either to its domestic law enforcement or if uh, the FCPA would apply to the DOJ or SEC? Well, the only place that we really see disclosure occurring or considered locally is Brazil because there's a mechanism in place to do so on the, under the Clean Companies Act. Even there, though, they're real barriers to doing so. I mean, one of the key things, and we've been discussing this since, you know, the legislation was being designed. There have been people pointing this out. You know, the problem is that under this law, so many authorities have the potential to bring cases that if you're a company, you know, who do you settle with, right? Um, so that's, I know, a real 
concern and a real consideration for several companies now. So you don't see the affirmative disclosure steps that you might see in the United States. And Brazil is probably as you know, far along as any country w with respect to local disclosures. Now, disclosures to, to, to authorities in the United States, what's going on based on my own perspective is many of these large uh, uh, multinationals based in Latin America are starting to realize that they need U.S. lawyers, they need U.S. and FCPA lawyers, you know, if they don't have them already, to guide them through these matters. And if a company is facing the question of disclosure, um, the, you know, the analysis is, is the same as the analysis would be for a U.S. company, right? I mean, you're weighing the pros, the cons. Um, and and you're letting the company decide, okay, what to do. So um, that is occurring. Um, I guess I, I predict that it will keep occurring, you know, as more of these large multinationals, especially the ones that are publicly listed in the United States, uh, retain FCPA counsel and get more educated on this issue. Well, thanks for sharing your insights uh, today, Matt. It's... Um... It's a niche world out there, and, and even in the FCPA space, it's oftentimes a, a niche practice. And if Latin America is an area of companies of uh, concern, well, Matt Ellis is, in my opinion, one of the best in that category. So thanks again uh, for joining us on this episode. Well, thank you, Mike, and your endorsement definitely means a lot, and I'll be sure to send you a copy of the FTP in Latin America book once it's published. Yeah, and, and I encourage readers to uh, to check in with the FCPA Americas blog, where, where Matt frequently writes about the topics, uh, including those discussed today. So thanks again, Matt. Thanks, Mike. Have a, have a great day.